All right. So anyway, um, let's bring the script up here. So I just want to welcome everyone to our, our, our Zoom. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to host uh, Moses Michelle. We were just talking with, with Moses here uh, of Austin Public Radio, KUT, uh, to talk about his podcast, uh, The Disconnect, Power of Politics and the Texas Blackout. Uh, this was a, an in-depth investigation uh, into the February statewide power outage that, uh, that we all experienced. You know? um, I'll be, I'm going to actually drop a link into the chat here um, to the podcast. So in case you haven't had a chance to go check it, you know, I urge you to go get it because it's, it's a, a super uh, interesting podcast. Let me just put that in there and you'll have it. Um, and of course, it's, it's in our, our, uh, our meeting as well. Now, normally on our meetings, uh, we like to recognize all the candidates for office, and I see a few that are, that are, that are showing up here. Uh, today, we've got a lot of ground to cover with Bose, so uh, I'm going to ask my co-hosts to please uh, just, you know, when you see the folks that are uh, candidates, just put a note in the chat so people can recognize them, and, and, and please thank them for, for being here. Sandeep, I see you. Thanks for showing up. I really appreciate you. Um, you know, we do appreciate all you candidates, and thank you for running. So Mose, welcome. Uh, you know, we're also happy to have you here today. And uh, honestly, this is really exciting for me to see. I'm kind of a little bit of a little, you know, fanboying out here. Um, you know, the unique thing about this blackout that we had, uh, you know, unlike uh, a lot of the disasters that you have, like a tornado or, or even like something like Hurricane Harvey, um, as big as they are, they're still pretty local, right? They're not that, they don't cover a lot of ground. Um, but this blackout, literally everybody in the state of Texas experienced it you know we all have a story to tell including yeah. you know, there's some folks here on on the on the on the zoom today who had huge problems uh, in fact uh barb walters who i think is she's got her video off she actually had almost the entire downstairs of her home destroyed by because uh, oh, of broken pipes yeah. so you know all of us have have a story all of us in texas experienced it it's you know i think it's just a really unique thing about about this blackout uh, so, you know, I'd like you to introduce yourself here in a minute, but I want to play a short clip from the trailer uh, for the podcast, just because I, I, I thought it was really cool. So let me let me play that here real quick. Uh, let's see. This. So this is the beginning of what might be a historic winter storm here in Austin. It just started down here. Big question for a lot of people right now is whether the uh, electric grid is going to hold up. Woo! Guess what? It didn't. When you flip that switch at any hour, what comes on is people power. People working for you just to see that you live better electrically. Early Monday morning at 2 a.m., our power went out. I woke up Tuesday morning around 4.30 to the sound of every electronic device in my house shutting down. We are going on, look at my watch, we're going on about 30 hours or more of no power. Over 100 hours. It was a while before I realized it was often going to stay up. Millions of Texans lost power for days. Hundreds of people may have died. And people wondered, how could this happen in the energy capital of America? You live better, Texas Electric World. Oh, I don't need to winterize. No, oh, that might actually work out to our benefit. Let's go have a beer and talk this over. So anyway, uh, yeah, that's the, the kickoff to the pod. And uh, I, I decided it was a great way to start this off today. So, you know, Moe, maybe you can introduce yourself. Tell us a little about the disconnect and, and, and how it came to be. Absolutely. Well, and, and as you heard that first voice, there was me. I was, I was uh, uh, you know, initially kind of uh, excited about all the snow we were getting. So I was recording myself, you know, going out and watching it fall down. Um, basically, so... Me, I'm a public radio reporter uh, based here in Austin at KUT 90.5. I've been reporting on energy and the environment for years and years now. Um, I, my, I do stuff uh, for the local, you know, I, I do stuff locally here, but I also do a lot of statewide reporting and national reporting. You can hear me on a lot of the national programs uh, on, on NPR. And um, 
basically when the blackout hit, uh, we were confronted, for, you know, living through it just like everybody else, we were first confronted with the challenge of trying to stay warm and trying to figure out how we were gonna get back to the newsroom to, to report on it as it was happening. But we were also very quickly um, uh, confronted with the challenge of making sense of, of this uh, terrible tragedy uh, uh, in light of how uh, kind of confusing it, 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 it was and poorly communicated it was at, at the time. I've reported on the on the Texas Electric Grid for years, and and even as this was happening, you know, you heard um, you heard our state officials and grid operators talking about how they were do, they were doing like load shed, you know, and how there were going to be planned outages, things that things that no normal person should really understand, you know, what exactly that means, and uh, especially load shed, right, which means they're cutting power, um, and so. Very quickly in the in the um, in the days of the blackout, I, it, it it seemed almost as though my job was to kind of translate and and like explain all of these things and concepts that were being made, frankly, like more confusing than they had to be. <laughs> um, and so, uh, uh, as we started uh, kind of uh, getting away from the the immediate emergency, we're getting you know tons of questions from listeners. We have all these questions ourselves about what happened, and it just became very clear very quickly that it was going to be more than you know a kind of feature project. Like we we wanted to dig in, and we wanted to produce a series. We wanted to start at the beginning, like when the grid really started in the state. And one thing that we had, that I've been heard a lot about in my reporting, and that we heard more and more about after the blackout, was the way the state power grid changed about 20 years ago when the state deregulated its its a uh, energy markets. And we, uh, so we wanted to take the listener from the start through that really pivotal mo moment in the grid and then into the days of the blackout, really do a kind of day by day of exactly what went wrong and when, and then cover the political fallout um, and the, you know, the, the reaction, the response as it's, as it's stood up till now, really. So it starts a long time ago and it really brings the listener to where we are at right now. Uh, that's a that's a kind of postage stamp version, I guess, of, of what the podcast is about. So you know, I've got a ton of questions for you, and uh, you know I'm going to kind of bounce around a little bit. From Absolutely, different parts of, of the of the pod. And and folks, if if you have questions uh, for Mo's, you know, please put them in the chat. Um, my co-host will kind of keep track of them. We'll try to get a few in towards the end. Um, but you know. I guess the, the, the way where I want to start, you know, tell us a little bit about how in the heck this happened. How is the power grid in this state designed in such right. a way that it's prone to failure when power is most needed, whether it's in the winter when it's super cold or in the summer when it's super hot? Um, and, and, I, and it's really important to like the first thing you mentioned, this is like the power grid in the state. Right. So so the first thing to remember is that Texas is the only state that operates its own kind of sovereign grid. And it's not all of Texas, but it's about. 90% of Texans um, get their electricity off the ERCOT grid. This is, ERCOT's a, a you know, name now we're all very familiar with, right? Um, this is the grid that failed uh, to the most catastrophic level when other parts of the state and the country that experienced a similar storm, a similar freeze, did not, did not experience that level of failure, right? So right away, you know that something went wrong specifically with this grid. Your question was about uh, why why does this grid uh, operate in such a way that in, when we are in the middle of an energy emergency, uh, if you correct me if I'm wrong. The, 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 were you asking about the price of power? Like when when, well, when we're in, in I mean, so so how is it that that it, it fail? It, it's prone to failure. I mean, it, yeah, it, yeah. Okay, so I, I so, took away from the pod that it, that it's yeah. designed for that, right? I, well, yeah, no. I mean, and it's it's fascinating to see this is this is something that almost everybody agrees with now, right? That that analysis of the grid is being repeated now by the by the the people on the Public Utility Commission, the chair of the Public Utility Commission recently called this a, uh, a crisis based business model, right? right. Um, nobody would have said that uh, a year ago, at, at least nobody in the in the kind of halls of power would have said that up until this blackout, there was, you know, our system's pretty good. It's this unique Texas system. What it is, is a system, as you as you say, that is um, it's a, a deregulated energy only 
uh, competitive market. And uh, you'll have to forgive me, this gets a little wonky, but it is important. What we have in Texas is a grid where electric generators are paid only for selling uh, you know, megawatts of power. Uh, you know, they, they only get paid when they sell electricity to the grid. And, and it is a market based, as most markets will be, on supply and demand. So uh, right away, you see that that means that, that uh, electricity is going to be worth more to electric generators when there is less of it, right? So when demand for electricity is high and supply is scarce. Now, what that describes is, is a blackout, right? That describes a, a state on the uh, of the grid that is at least very close to a blackout. So, um, so, so it, this is kind of built into the market design. And uh, energy generators, they base you know their kind of investments in building power plants on how often they're going to see these high prices, like it's called scarcity pricing for electricity. And so you've created a market then that that it, that brings the grid close, close, close to a blackout as a matter of necessity in order to incentivize more construction of, of, uh, of power plants and power generators. And the argument in favor of that, uh, when the market was designed, when we deregulated, was that it was very efficient. You didn't have a lot of superfluous generation laying around um, and that that could translate into lower electric prices. There is a lot of research that suggests that did not happen, uh, but that was the idea. Um, uh, the argument against it is that it is reckless and that you know you want a nice big cushion of generation to help people avoid uh, the, the type of catastrophe that we suffered through in February. Yeah. Now, the, this, this statewide blackout shouldn't have come to a surprise to anybody that is involved in any way with, with the power generation in the state. We had a similar situation that was not fortunately statewide in 2011. Um, now, why didn't the state address some of these problems post-2011? What, what happened that kind of led to us being, uh, again, unready in, in 2021? I mean, there's been a lot of good, good reporting on this. And what happened, in, in, the, the situation in 2011 was very similar to what happened to us this year. And again, it was a, it was a cold weather spell. And again, it didn't just knock generation out. It also... Um, interfered with the natural gas supply to power plants, which was a, a part of what we, what, what we saw happen in February. After that, you have, uh, you have lawmakers promise to fix things. You have, uh, commit, you, know, you, have, you have commissions called and reports released. Uh, and, and likewise, at the federal level, you had, uh, you had for, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and, and other groups uh, release their findings about how to fix this thing. What we saw, though, was that there was no. Uh, th these were these were all uh, more or less suggestions, right? There were there was there was no teeth behind these these new uh, findings. Uh, so it, they didn't go to these power plants and say, "You got to winterize. You've got to do A, B, and C." They said, "Here's a an idea that would be a best practice. You know that we maybe will check up on you on, but there's no there's going to be no uh, you know fine or no punishment associated with this." I mean. Uh, and, and, and so then when you saw the same thing happen in February again, well, we had even worse results. In, in, the broad, in the broad kind of analysis of this, you could look at this and you could say, this is a product of government that was, that was unwilling to stand up to industry, right? Unwilling to create regu a regulatory framework that was really going to push industry into a safer position. Um, and, and now we're, seeing, we're, we're watching what's unfolding and seeing how how the reaction may be the same and may be different this time. I just want to add one more thing. There was also, of course, a lot of lobbying after 2011, and and we'll, we're seeing it again now. You know, where you might have, uh, you might have a, a public official say, "We we want to do this. We got to fix this," but then you know, come to find out uh, down the road that they are getting all this pressure from industry groups and also often a lot of political donations uh, that uh, that are clearly designed to. To uh, to kind of push them push push them away from actually doing uh, really serious regulation, right? And of course, you know, we saw it in June. You know, Governor Abbott received a a, a one million dollar donation from the CEO of Energy Transfer Partners, right, which is one of the largest uh, gas pipeline companies in the in the state. Yeah, and and a company that was one of, the, if I'm not mistaken, one of the uh, largest uh, uh, kind of beneficiaries of the high. Uh, uh, natural gas prices during the blackout. I mean, right. a lot of companies, 
we a lot we often talk about the blackout in terms of the companies that lost money, of which there were many. Um, but but in a in a market, generally speaking, when you talk about money lost on one side, you're talking about money someone else made, right? And so uh, there there were a lot of companies that 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 did quite well for themselves during that week. Yeah. Now this is kind of a you know, this is very interesting interesting to me. You know, I'm I'm a I'm a software guy, not a not a hardware guy. Um, the the way I understand it, the grid was literally at, at one point on Sunday on Sunday night, um, within a few minutes from just catastrophic failure yeah. that that would have actually um, potentially taken the grid offline almost statewide for weeks, if not if not even months. To tell us a little bit about what that what happened to that and how could a, a power power failure result in in hardware failure across the state. It's so crazy. I mean, and, and, and again, this just highlights how kind of how complicated and messy this becomes because we're talking about this thing as a as a financial market, right? But then we're also talking about it as a, as a piece, as you said, of hardware, right? Like the grid is a physical thing that carries electricity all around the state, and this this physical thing it re, it is it re, it's required to be in balance at all times. What you need on the grid is uh, the same amount of energy is going on the grid as is coming off demand and supply constantly in balance. And if they do not stay in balance, very bad things happen. The, like the, 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 the grid can physically break and kind of come apart at the seams and crash uh, what, they call, in a, what they call a catastrophic failure. So the grid, this means this is not what we experienced in February. What we experienced in February were intentional power cuts. And they did that to, to keep the balance on the grid because there was so little electricity left to put on there. They had to cut everyone's power in order to save the grid from going out of balance. There were, there were several moments during that week where uh, we, were ex we were minutes away from the, the power, from the grid falling out of balance to a level where it could have crashed the entire system to the point where you, you, there's no power left in Texas. There's no more grid anymore, right? And, and if you can just conceive of how, uh, you know, devastating how what a humanitarian crisis what we went through was was a severe uh you know humanitarian crisis but doesn't it pales in comparison to what we could have seen had the grid literally broken down and we are talking about you know i, I don't know a, a national emergency i think at a scale that I, I i could hardly conceive of uh you know the way they react to this and this is the rationale really for what they did at ERCOT, you know to, to to lock down the grid, cut so many people's power, and keep it off for days, uh, was it was to avoid that outcome, and that's you know that that seems like an outcome that was very close. And there were also like I mean, when you look at how close we were, uh, there was problems at a nuclear plant. Uh, there were probably you know just problems at several large generators. If they had just been a little worse, again, it's it's just it's kaput. It's goodbye. Um, the way they restart the grid after that type of catastrophic failure is a process called Black Start. And we all, uh, as energy consumers in the state, uh, pay uh, certain gen power generators to be always available to supply power. Um, because when the, when the grid goes dark, you need a few generators that you know are gonna work to start slowly putting power back online, spreading it across the grid to eventually repower the entire grid. It's almost like, you know, you got to jumpstart one generator up and get a little electricity on and it kind of spreads out, maintaining this balance I'm, I was talking about the entire time. We came to find out very quickly after the blackout that our, our black start uh, generating units, the, these units that, that are, you know, the, the thing that's supposed to save us after a catastrophic failure, even those units uh, had trouble. About half of them were not operational. And so again, uh, the 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 proximity we came to uh, unimaginable crisis uh, is uh, still frightening to, to consider, really. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, and, and that's and, and just as an aside, y'all. Um, there's a there's a mini episode uh, in the podcast series that specifically talks about this black start that yeah. Moses is talking about. So if you're interested in that, go listen to that one because it's it, it's both fascinating and infuriating because, as Mo said. Um, we pay extra. We pay a tax. Every one of us who buys energy from the grid, and it's all of us here, uh, we all pay a tax that funds these guys to be up for this reason, right? Because if it ever goes down, they have to have them available. And they actually weren't online. And, and you know, 
most who who was responsible for for ensuring that those black star plants are up is it is it puc or is it ERCOT? i mean when you're talking about ERCOT, and this is something that i think was also like interesting to dig into uh it, it just depends on how far how, how high up the chain of command you want to go right i mean like ERCOT is the grid operator right. and ERCOT is a very strange creature because it's uh it's a it's a it's a nonprofit group that is kind of quasi governmental, but they always try to maintain a kind of like uh, uh, kind of. For example, as a reporter, it's difficult to get open records from them, right? They they kind of they they play it like they're not really completely connected to the government, even though clearly they're they are you know their their bosses are the people at the PUC, the Public Utility Commission of Texas, and so insofar as a failure happens at ERCOT. Um, it is also, I mean, I think it's quite uh, reasonable to say uh, that a failure at the Public Utility Commission, which is which is the regulatory agency that controls ERCOT. And again, if ERCOT wants to say that they're a nonprofit, if ERCOT wants to say that they are not essentially, um, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Like, like they don't have the same responsibilities to to voters and to Texas citizens as a as a a state agency would have, well then what's the state agency? The state agency is the public utility commission. Right. So so who who failed then? Who was who I, I think they both did. <laughs> Sorry, that was a really long-winded, that was a really long-winded answer. But like, but you know, I just I heard a lot of people shaking their fists at ERCOT during this yeah. whole thing. And there were clear, clear problems that you know ERCOT messed up in a lot of different ways. But especially initially, there was a kind of like I felt like there was not a lot of uh, further scrutiny up the chain of command to say, oh, okay, well, you know, the Public Utility Commission, they're the guys that really like, they're, they're ERCOT's boss and they, they seem to be out to lunch, frankly. So, so those, those, are the, those are the two agencies that got the most scrutiny. Yeah. The third agency that sort of slunk off, I think, into the, into the, into the corner and, and hope no one would have noticed them was the Railroad Commission, right? Which of course doesn't, doesn't regulate railroads, it regulates oil and gas. Now, what was their involvement in this, uh, specifically pertaining to the gas pipelines? Which this was another shock to me was that that almost all the gas supply, natural gas supply, is in real time directly from the fields. I had no idea. Yeah, I mean, there there is a, there is storage, and you know, there are uh, it, like there's there's that type of backup supply, but a lot of it really is it's 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 mind boggling to think about. Like like uh, I've I've there's a guy who works in the pipeline industry that I interview sometimes, and he's described it to me before. As like, if you imagine like somewhere out, there's an oil well or there's a gas well somewhere out in the fields, there is essentially a pipeline like from that, from the ground there that runs and it runs through a processing facility and it, you know, it runs through some different kind of infrastructural things, but essentially runs in a straight line to, if, to your stovetop if you have a gas burner, right? You know, like, and, and to imagine that uh, system is, is pretty, uh, pretty mind boggling. Anyhow, uh, the Railroad Commission of Texas, the uh, yeah, the uniquely named uh, oil and gas regulator of the state, is responsible for uh, for pipelines and for regulating the uh, oil and gas industry uh, in the field. Um, and uh, what happened during the blackout was that, uh, in the same way that this uh, historic freeze hits uh, power generators, it hits um, it hit uh, uh, oil and gas producers. There were problems with their with their infrastructure. There were problems with the wellhead. There are problems with compressor stations, uh, gas processing plants that caused the uh, that caused the uh, gas to stop flowing. Uh, there was also a lot of speculation that there was uh, market manipulation there too, which is something a whole other thing. Uh, but but uh, but uh, suffice to say, the freeze also uh, shut down gas supply. Right. And so you what we had was a situation where there were uh, natural gas power plants that were still uh, able to generate electricity for us. But could not because they didn't have the fuel that they need. Right. Yeah. And and so when you start looking at the failure of that gas system, well, the, the agency that's responsible is the railroad commission. And uh, the and unlike the public utility commission, railroad commissioners are elected uh, statewide. Right. Uh, public utility commissioners are appointed by the governor. Uh, railroad commissioners are elected statewide. And it was interesting to see uh, the way that uh, they, you know, they approached the the. <laughs> They, they came at they came at their response to criticism in a much more uh, maybe like political way in, in part probably because they're politicians uh, 
uh, but they but they very clearly, uh, you know, there was this kind of uh, famous early committee hearing that we cover in the in the final episode of the of the podcast, where Christy Craddock, who's the chair of the Railroad Commission, essentially, you know, comes in to to speak to lawmakers and and says, you know, it doesn't say, oh, there were problems, oh, uh, you know, we have to fix A, B, and C, but says you're welcome, you know, like like essentially kind of tries to spin it to the degree that saying that they did, they saved the state. You know, they, they, had, they had nothing to do with the problems, which, you know, is demonstrably, demonstrably untrue, uh, right. you know, when you look at what happened. Yeah. Um, uh, what we're doing now, uh, the, the, the legislative session happened in spring where they, where they dealt with this, and, um, and some laws were passed uh, uh, that, you know, that, uh, that, that, man, that, that told state agencies to try to fix this. And, where we're at now in the state is in the kind of nitty gritty of that of that of what's happening in those agencies at the railroad commission at the public utility commission. This is really uh, tricky stuff to follow. It's it's uh, it's stuff that like uh, is is most people don't have time to pay attention to. Most people don't have time to pay attention to what lawmakers are doing in Austin. But like, are you going to log on to like a a work session of the public utility commission that's starting on a Tuesday morning? You know, like where they're where they're hearing about all this, it's very difficult. And so what, what I'm trying to do as a reporter and what many reporters are trying to do now is follow along as best we can to see where this goes because it's still unclear like what type of overhaul or reform or whatever you wanna call it is really going to come out of this. Well, I mean, hold on a minute. So, so you know, Governor Abbott back in June, you know, he said, hey, it's fixed. You know, we, we fixed everything. It's, it's all set. And he, he made a big deal out of it. You know, everything that needed to be done was done to fix the power grid in Texas. Yeah. So, but yeah. that's not the case, right? I mean, I, I don't, I, I, I haven't spoken to anybody, uh, you know, who isn't, who isn't kind of, I think, speaking from an extremely uh, partisan position that would say that that's the case. Uh, you know, like, I, I was surprised that he said that because, because, you know, after he said that, we had another, we had another um, we, uh, conservation call. You know, right. I mean, like, like we, there was a lot of concern uh, going into July and August about how the grid was going to hold up. Uh, it, it was not, we had two calls for conservation during relatively mild weather in the spring. This, and this is after this, yeah. this catastrophic blackout. And it, and it was frankly, uh, just as a kind of, you know, as, a, you know, as an observer, it was surprising to me to hear, uh, to hear the governor kind of state so uh, unequivocally that they had, that they had fixed everything because again uh, a week later uh, we were being asked to conserve electricity again because there wasn't enough juice uh, yeah. potentially on the system. Um, these things do you know these things do take a long time to fix. It's not as though that they could uh, they could wave a magic wand and and fix the Texas grid you know uh, immediately. Right. But but uh, but to say that we did everything. You know that that needed to be done is I just don't see how you can say that uh, so early on. In the, in the same way that you can't expect them to fix it all quickly, you can't say we did fix it all <laughs> that <Exactly>. quickly. <laughs> well, and, and what I what I would have would have appreciated, you know, I think, and probably a lot of us would have appreciated, is not not so much saying, oh, we fixed it, um, or we're not going to fix it, but we understand what went wrong, and we're gonna we have a plan to address those problems so that it doesn't happen again. That would have been a really good answer. And, and of course, that's not what we heard. Um, you know, one thing that I, I want to touch on, um, I, fortunately, no one that I know um, died. I don't think anyone that I know actually even had family members that died. But, you know, the, the, the public health, the, the Texas Department of, of, of Public Health, the state health services, reported that there was like 150 people who died during that, that storm week. But there was an investigation by, by BuzzFeed, and I'm going to put this link in the chat as well, that said, there might have been up to 700 and, and maybe even more people who died. What, what, what do you know about that? I, I don't. Uh, I don't know much more than what you just said. I mean, I've been. I've been trying to track. We haven't done our own uh, look in the newsroom. At, you know, our own analysis. But I've been trying to track all the different uh, numbers that we hear. Yeah. It clearly seems like the official count uh, is is on the low end of estimates. What what the BuzzFeed estimate did, if I'm not mistaken is a similar thing they've actually done with uh, trying to estimate uh, coronavirus uh, mortality, which is it, it looked at excess deaths during that time. That's to say the number of people who died during the blackout that would not, who, who would, would not normally, have, we wouldn't have statistically seen that number of deaths. So it's, it's over what we would have expected given the history of the state. 
And that seems a very reasonable way to try to arrive at a, at a number. Right. Um, it's also a question of like, at what point do you blame the blackout, right? I had, I, I, and, and again, this is something I'd like to do more reporting on because as we were doing this, I was getting uh, heartbreaking e uh, emails from people who, uh, one story a woman shared was, you know, she had a friend who was in hospice uh, who uh, 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 had cancer um, and then lost power. And it, it sound, you know, her friend did not have long, uh, it sounded like, but then ended up dying in, during the blackout uh, in the cold, right? Uh, not, I mean, it's, I don't know how that death was counted. I, you know, I, I, I'm not sure how someone like that, whether that's considered just a, an unblackout related death or not. Yeah. Um, in other cases, we had a, a ton of, we had a lot of people that have carbon monoxide poisoning that's, you know, pretty clearly linked to, to being, trying to warm yourself in the cold. Yeah. Um, and then hypothermia, people die of heart attacks or heart failure. You know, would, would that have happened if they hadn't been freezing? Um, anyway, uh, sorry, I'm kind of rambling now, but but it's a good question. Last thing I'll say on that is that it does seem that uh, the state estimates are on the low end. And as a, a journalist, I would uh, I, I feel that I, I would like to see the state do a a, a, a put more effort into a, a an, into an accounting of those deaths. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And and of course, you know, we we've. Sadly, we've seen the same sort of thing with COVID, right? You know, can can we really trust uh, some of these states, um, some of these county public health departments to, to really count the deaths? Um, similar sorts of, of excess deaths um, have been used, uh, you know, in, in Texas, elsewhere in the U.S., uh, globally, in other countries to measure COVID deaths. And anywhere from, you know, 25% to maybe even 50% more uh, if you look at the excess deaths for a given period. Um, yeah. That are being reported. So yeah, and 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 of course, like you said, you know, people of course froze to death in their homes, which is is terrible. There was a lot of the carbon monoxide, but we I also read quite a lot about, you know, people who and we have a lot of them in Texas who rely on on medical equipment, you know, Absolutely. whether it's, it's oxygen yeah. or a um, you know something something for you know for diabetes, uh, other types of, of of medical devices that need electricity, and they couldn't get to where they needed to be because of the roads and they can yep. need them at home because there's no power. Yep. So again, sort of a sort of a, 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 a multiple ways that people could have died. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, we in our we we try to talk about the human uh face of this throughout the entire series yeah. and uh and during in the episode that specifically treats the blackout, we try to include as many yeah. stories uh as we can and voices, you know, we had people calling and sharing their stories during the thing during while it was happening and then people I interviewed after the fact. Yeah. Um, and we talk about some of these cases, but I, I feel like, yeah, you can't talk about it enough. And I don't want to, um, well, I don't want to get in, in the way of your next question, but even when you look beyond, uh, many of those who survived this still ended up uh, financially and emotionally, uh, you know, in, um, uh, ruined in a lot of cases. And, uh, and that's another thing that we're still uh, dealing with. Well, and, and the, the last the, the last episode, right, you know, you, you kind of began and ended with um, this woman, Caroline, Caroline Edison Rivera. Yeah, Rivera. Um, I think she's down in, in Houston, um, yeah, East Houston, who's a retired, retired teacher, you know, which obviously not a tremendous amount of income as a retired teacher. Um, but, you know, just really uh, living on a shoestring normally. And, and suddenly she's got, um, not only does she have damage in her home that she needed to, to have to go back and fix, she was terrified that she was going to, you know, have a, a very, very large utility bill over the course of the summer. And so, you know, she froze in the winter and she was baking all summer long because she was afraid to turn her air conditioning back up, um, you know, for... In fact, you know, one of the things that I just saw recently uh, about Ida, which of course is the hurricane that went through Louisiana a couple yeah. weeks ago, people were dying not from the flooding, but from the heat, right, and the power outage, and, and that's obviously a dangerous thing, especially for for older people. Now, most of the people on this in, in Plano, most people that are on the Zoom, we're all relatively affluent people. This power outage and the and the fallout, I think, like many things, has hit you know, people who are poor 
far more so than, than, than everybody else. And, and, and there's been nothing done to help them. Is that a fair statement? I mean, after, and again, uh, to talk about something I'd like to cover more, yeah. um, dur during the blackout and afterwards, the Public Utility Commission instituted a moratorium on utility disconnections. Uh, so uh, for a little while, they said, you can't cut people's power off for non-payment of their bills uh, while we sort out uh, what happened in the blackout. Uh, the, then, you know, state, the state legislature convenes and there's a lot, a lot, a lot of attention on the, on the big companies that lost uh, millions and billions. And, and uh, how are we going to save the, uh, the, elect the energy market? How are we going to essentially uh, structure bailouts for these companies, these big utilities and, and what have you uh, to allow them to not go bankrupt? Uh, no, no, nothing about, about uh, helping individual rate payers. Uh, and the, the example that you give of, of Carolyn Rivera, again, this is a woman who um, her, her bills were associated with the blackout primarily because they had to do with burst pipes. You know, she lost power for days, her pipes break, she is suddenly thousands of dollars, you know, uh, in debt to, uh, to uh, the repairman. <laughs> and uh, she is on a very limited income as a retired school teacher and finds herself in a situation as the summer heat begins to bear down where she, uh, she basically, you know, she's keeping her AC in the low 80s because, or maybe low to mid 80s, because she's worried she's not going to pay her electric bill. And the Public Utility Commission has just ended the moratorium on disconnections. Yeah. So, so, so again, somebody who has been completely uh, um, uh, kind of victimized by this by this system uh, is 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 staring down, getting our power cut off in the in the worst heat of summer by the same, essentially by the same system, if if you will. Uh, uh, there was there was some push near the end of the legislative session to to create a structure for helping individual ratepayers, people who are really, really uh, slammed by this thing. But of course it didn't happen. And then there was also a kind of concern among people I talked to that, that those, if there had been a law that made it through, that the degree to which that would have just ended up being a, uh, a kind of corporate bailout in disguise was also a kind of open question, right? I mean, like, are you talking about direct ratepayer relief you know, like a check in someone's hands, or are you kind of talking about giving money to their utility company that then the utility company says, oh, this is going to help our customers. Dude, just don't ask why, you know, or how. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah and, and, you know, the, the really sad thing for, for Ms. Rivera, you know, she actually went to Austin and testified and yeah. asked for relief. Yeah. And of course, you know, the lawmakers there just basically said, thank you very much. Next. And she's an incredibly inspiring woman too, because she, you know, when I talked to her, she's in, I believe she's in her eighties. Right. And, uh, and, and she did not know, at least she told me she didn't know about any of the stuff before, before the blackout happened. A lot of us didn't, right. We, we weren't familiar with the way the grid works and all these different things. And having lived through this experience, she educated herself about all of these things, you know, coming to realize how the grid is managed and, uh, and you know who's in charge of it, and uh, yeah, really uh, uh, got into trying to advocate for herself. Uh, yeah, it, it, you know, and she said she's she told me you know that she's going to keep doing. It. Yeah, she's not done. This is like this is her thing now. Well, good for her, and and yeah. uh, and and gosh, I wonder if we can maybe help her out a little bit. Um, you know, I've got a few questions that are popping up in chat. So one 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 question that came up is uh, exactly who appoints individuals to ERCOT and the PUC. Um, so PUC, and, and this has changed uh, a little bit since the last uh, legislative session, but uh, traditionally and up until February, uh, PUC, uh, their governor's appointees, um, and ERCOT uh, has been, the board of ERCOT has traditionally been um, uh, control, controlled by uh, uh, groups of stakeholders. The, the, the board is a different what they call stakeholders are assigned seats on this board. And then essentially the, 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 the stakeholder groups that represent them choose who they're gonna send up. So you might have, and, and uh, it's funny even to describe it because it sounds pretty crazy, but uh, 
So you might see, so, so what are some stakeholders in the ERCOT system? They're transmission companies, right? Transmission people. They are um, generation companies. So people that, companies that own power plants um, and power generators. They are uh, public power. Uh, and I think there might just be one, they're, they're, there's, there's not much seat, there's not much room at this table for public utilities, but there, there is, a, there was, uh, there was some for uh, uh, municipally owned utilities and co-ops, uh, large industrial consumers. Uh, and this is an interesting part of like the Texas grid and the kind of like politics of it that I think doesn't get a lot of attention, but like uh, one very powerful voice in like the way we manage and organize our grid are large uh, manufacturing concerns, oil and gas industry that runs big refineries. These are the consumers that like they, they, they use a lot of electricity and as such, they, uh, they're a large stakeholder. And so they, they have seats on this board. And these groups essentially kind of get, th th these groups, they don't always share the same interests. And you know, very often they, their interests diverge. You, want, you don't want to generate power, you want to sell it as much as you can. If you're, if you're a, uh, a large consumer of power, you want to pay as less as you, as you can. Uh, uh, but they all kind of get together and create uh, these, the rules by which ERCOT is governed. The, right. the protocols of, uh, of ERCOT they're typically called. So, um, and I've never seen that book, but it's apparently like, it's like you know, this thick. It's just like a bunch of really wonky market rules, you know, that, that determine how you're supposed to operate in this market. And uh, uh, since since the blackout, ERCOT has uh, switched to a political appointment system as well. Right. Um, so that's that's different now, but uh, but uh, it was a it was a kind of stakeholders game for a long time. Right. So now the on the on ERCOT, those are all appointed by Abbott, right? Uh, on the PUC? Board, the board, no, ERCOT, the board of directors. Yeah, yeah. Now, nowadays, no, there, there is going to be, I, I should actually look this up, but I think that there's a split between uh, the governor, the, uh, and maybe the speaker of the house, um, but political appointees anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, what I thought was really interesting, you know, the, 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 the interesting thing, right, of course, is that prior to February, no one outside of, of, of a very small number of people at the government level even knew what ERCOT was, uh, let alone that there were board members. What I thought was interesting was that there was at least, what, four or five of them who actually lived outside of the state. Yeah, that were, on, that were on our cot. You know, people in Michigan and elsewhere that that are managing our grid. It's like, well, why are you on here? How did you get on this 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 body that's responsible for our power grid? Yeah, I mean, the answer to that was, I think, in, in, at least in some cases, these were. I know there's one guy in particular I'm thinking of who were like market design experts, right? Mm -hmm. So their argument would, would be like, would be like, well, yeah, sure, he doesn't live in Texas, but he's like a uh, uh, a very uh, well-respected energy market person. So we'll have him on. Um, I heard I, it, it certainly uh, shocked a lot of people when they found that out and, and they, they changed the rules. Now they, they're not allowing people yeah. outside of Texas to, to be on the ERCOT board. But uh, uh, the, um, the, uh, the argument in favor, <laughs> one argument in favor of having people outside of Texas that I remember hearing from a, a guy at UT who who uh, works on grid stuff is that it might be good to have people from like colder climates. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> if it, like if you might want someone from Canada to be to you know like to be on the ERCOT board if we're going to keep getting these freak snowstorms. Yeah. That, that might that might have been a little tongue in cheek, but I could also see some some kind of some logic behind it. So th this is this has been uh, mostly me asking questions. I think we had that last one was was uh, one, one from one of our our audience here. Um, any other questions for Mo's or I've got a bunch, so I can keep going, but I want to make sure I'll give you all a chance to, to ask a few. Nothing? Nothing, come on. All right, I'll keep going. <laughs> I got plenty. So, so you know, one thing that I think is really, and, and, and Mo's, I'll, I'll tell you, um, I moved, so I'm, I'm originally from California, um, I, I, and I, I, I grew up there. I was in the military for a long time, and then I, I got out, and I was in the California for a few years. And I moved here to Plano in 2004. And right after California had their emergency around deregulated power, you talked a little bit about that yeah. in, in, in your, your pod. Um, back then, there was this little company called Enron that was gaming the system all over the place. And California is one of the ones where they're gaming it. Now, 
the game they played in California is they were actually able to um, to take power because California is part of this Western grid. They could take power out of the state. Wait till the you know the 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 need. This is primarily in the summer. Wait till the the demand went way up. Then they would bring it back in and sell it for the top price. And it just was screwing all of it. I mean, we this is like in 2000, 2001, 2002. We were all just getting just just really screwed, with just gigantic bills because of what they were doing. And of course, they they finally got around to changing it so they can do it anymore. But you know that deregulation uh, process in California was all about the consumer. And that's what they said here, right? Deregulation is going to be, it's going to create this competitive market that's going to be super efficient. And it's going to be better prices for everybody. Is that really what they intended? Is that really how this market was set up? Or was it really set up maybe to support profits for generators and others? I mean, and not just generators, right? Uh, uh, energy traders like Enron. I mean, one of the, one of the uh, interesting things about Enron is that they were a, essentially an asset free company right they were they were simply trading the, the contracts you know to, to kind of maybe to oversimplify it a bit right like they didn't own any power plants um you know if you're going to give uh it, it a lot of people that 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 instituted uh, deregulation in texas uh it was not an either or thing for them right and and this was a this is a very common attitude back then i'm sure many of you remember that you know, what is good for the power company uh, is also going to be good for the consumer, right? You know, like, so, so we're going to pass this new way of doing things, uh, and it's going to be a win-win for everybody. Uh, and, it, it, you know, it, with 20 years of experience in this now, it appears as though that's not the case. I mean, if you look at uh, their, their, their studies, the Wall Street Journal uh, came out with a big article after the blackout on this, and there's a, there a, lot, of, a lot of people have done this, uh, comparing parts of the state that maintained their municipally or owned utilities versus parts of the state in the uh, in the deregulated retail market, and what you generally find if you run those numbers is that is that uh, there's an average lower cost for electricity in the pub in the publicly owned kind of islands that still exist in Texas. So your your Austins, your San Antonios. Um, uh, now that is not to say that you can't get lower prices in in the competitive retail market. Uh, it is possible, uh, but uh, I think a lot of people, um, especially after the black, you know, it's that requires a lot of shopping around, right? And and I guess it's just a kind of a question of like, how do you want to spend your time? <laughs> That's kind of a point of personal preference, but I mean, like your average consumer, according to these studies, pays more yeah. in the competitive market. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, you know, I mentioned at the start that that my neighborhood didn't never lost power. Yeah, now, I'm in this little sliver of North Plano that's part of CoSurf, which is one of these little cooperatives yeah. that, that, that's still around the state. So I, I actually don't have a choice. I have to be with yeah. CoSurf. Yeah. They, they, I mean, not only did I not lose power, I don't know if that was CoSurf's or just luck, but um, I also have not seen any spikes in my rates um, either. Yeah. Now, I saw one person on here, I, I can't remember who it was, uh, mentioned that they were a, a gritty customer. And of course, gritty customers... Oh wow! Were I mean they were the big losers across the board, right? You yeah, know, not only did they get so. not only did they get slammed with gigantic um, gigantic uh, bills, because you know that was the whole thing at Gritty, right? They they said, well, you know, we're going to take power and sell it to you at a few cents over wholesale, and you know, when the wholesale price is cheap, you're doing great. But when what, what was, what was, what's the maximum that they set the power to is like nine thousand dollars a kilowatt hour? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They 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 put it straight up to the very max. Yeah. Yeah, and and not only not only did they set it for that, but they actually went back and and retroactively set it to nine thousand dollars. It got very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is something that we try to we try to outline in the podcast. And again, I've seen that some people say they'd like to listen to it now. I really I'd love it if uh, you know if this talk could encourage more people to listen to it. I feel like it's one of the best things our station has done. And I'm not just saying that because I'm the host, uh, but uh, yeah. uh, uh, when you when you create this system to uh, where the where the price incentive is the only thing, the only real tool for the uh, regulators, what that means is that the only thing they can do in a crisis is set the price as high as it can go, yeah. <laughs> which is something that we're all going to be paying for. Yeah. And you, you know, you mentioned Jeff that you're not paying, you haven't noticed your rates go up yet. Right. But there was there was there were millions and millions of dollars uh, of unpaid bills yeah. uh, on the ERCOT market uh, after the blackout. 
And that, and the way ERCOT works is that it holds the bag for that, right? Um, so, I mean, like these are companies that can't pay ERCOT and so ERCOT can't pay the other companies that, that are asking for their money. And, and what one of the many things that the Public Utility Commission is doing right now is trying to figure out, craft a way to get that money to the people that that say they they you know they 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 deserve it, and basically you know bail ERCOT out of this pickle that it's in, yeah. and uh, and you know what that what that will translate to ultimately are higher bills for you know for most Texans uh, yeah. into the future. Yep. Well, and that, that was one of the, the 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 grid fixes that that Abbott came out with was a plan to to kind of bail some of these companies out by providing loans. Um, from the, that the state would guarantee um, that ultimately we're going to be paid by, by, you know, they'll pass it on to the ratepayers. So yeah, all of us are going to see, you know, higher rates overall because they're not going to pay it. They don't have to. The state basically said, don't worry, pass it on to your ratepayers and they'll cover it for you. Yeah, the, the, there's been a lot of um, the, the way that ERCOT is structured to, uh, I, I, <laughs> It's kind of like you can't really lose there, right? I mean, if, if things yeah, get messed yeah. up too much, you're just going to get bailed out. <laughs> yeah, right, so, like, right. what's the what's the motivation? But I don't know. So, so I guess that the last the last question that that I have for you as we kind of wrap up here, and I don't I don't think we have any any more from from our, our group here. Um, you know, if 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 you were if you were the the emperor of the the Republic of Texas, oh you, man, you could yeah, <laughs> you could wave your magic wand and. and yeah. And fix this. I mean, what are the what are the two or three things that we could do um, as a state that would actually that actually you know make improvements that, rather than than just you know kind of papering over the the situation? I I'd like to talk about one thing that has not come up yet, um, uh, but that I find really uh, interesting is uh, is the the notion we we began this conversation with with Texas having its own sovereign grid, our grid independence, and. Uh, one thing that most uh, analyses I've read uh, say is that if we had more interconnections with other parts of the country, we would not have suffered. Uh, we would not have suffered this blackout to the level that we did. Right? right. Uh, we we could have. We still would have had rolling blackouts. We still would have had uh, some days of dicey power. But you wouldn't have had a statewide crisis right. uh, with the deaths and the billions of dollars in losses that we that we had. There was really virtually no discussion of that in the halls of the Capitol uh, when they met to try to fix this thing. Uh, and and there's a lot of I've I've talked to a lot of people with different ideas about why that is. Why this very simple? I mean, I'm, it's not simple to connect our grid to the rest of the grid. It's complicated. There's a lot of you got to put a lot of infrastructure in. You have to kind of redesign the rules around how things operate a bit. But but it is it's simple in that it's something you can really wrap your mind around pretty easily. You know, like. We don't, we, in Texas, we can only use the power that we generate here because of our, we're this island. And so if we could, could connect, we could get more from elsewhere and that could really help us. Yeah. Um, that would be one thing that I would uh, imagine, you know, taking a much stronger look at. Uh, I, I've been told that, you know, when you start changing the rules of the game in here, a lot of people stand to lose money, right? Because, yeah. the, because the way the market's structured, certain people can benefit from that. And uh, so there's, I think, a lot of pressure to not even, take a serious look at that option. You know, the, one of the things that uh, I think one of the, I can't remember who it was, but someone that you interviewed talked about it. You know, if, if Texas was part of a, the, the broader grid, um, we could, our state could do, the generators could do something that, that people always talk about, which is screw over California. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Power <laughs> back to them, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. generate excess power and send it to California. And if you think about all the wind power that we generate in West Texas at night when we don't yeah. need it, that's right. You know that that could be used on the West Coast where that's it's right. a couple hours earlier. Absolutely. I mean, like that is there, there, there's a there's a big uh, there's a big market opportunity there that we're that's kind right. of leaving on the table exactly uh, by not taking so. a close look at that. But you know the other the other thing that occurred to me is that and and, and, and it, this kind of came to me when we saw this um, Colonial Pipeline go down right because yeah. of that that hack. Yeah. Texas not being on the grid, I mean, is that a national security risk? Because, yeah. because what if, right? What if a, a hack took down um, all of our pipelines and suddenly Texas uh, refineries were not able to, to get petroleum products, whether it's gas or oil or whatever, to other parts of the country? I mean, 
this was um this was something that came up uh uh when we did that that episode on black star right i mean like at that point if you're talking about the texas grid uh falling apart yeah. you're not just talking about a, a crisis in texas you're talking right. about a massive yeah. crisis you can come say hi Mo, if you want uh my kids my kid finally snuck up here yeah. uh you know a massive crisis for the entire country and there absolutely is an argument to be made yeah. that it's something that you know requires a deep look uh at the national level and it, yeah. and with that in mind uh i I, I could add that uh, I think it's next Thursday, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is coming out where they're having a, a meeting. And at this meeting, they're going to, um, they're going to uh, talk about some of the findings in the investigation that they've been doing into the Texas blackout. They're not releasing their full report yet. They've been doing an investigation for the last several months, but they are going to be addressing it for the first time publicly. And I think giving some kind of like high level findings in their open meeting. And that'll be really interesting to see uh, because, and again, you know, who knows the, the way these things go down usually kind of sets up a, a you know, state, federal, uh, you know, kind of tension. But, but uh, FERC, again, after the 2011 blackout, again, FERC did not, uh, did not do uh, firm mandates, you know, or kind of changes to the standards that were required. And, uh, indications are that they're going to do that this time you know so there's going to be new federal standards that uh texas even though it has its own grid will also have to uh you know follow um as we work on our own new standards here in the state too well yeah interesting and 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 you know mose i i, I hope that you you know look into some of these these follow-on issues and, and and kind of the next gen i'll be watching for those to pop up that again the, i i i was fascinated by this this podcast i i really recommend to all of my my uh my club members here that you, you go listen to it the, it's the links in the chat here we'll we'll, we'll put it up in our, our facebook group as well most thank you so much for coming on i really appreciate you hanging out with us for, hey, for an hour here on on friday yeah bring your kid over we love kids yeah, hey buddy come here say bye say bye to him it's okay all right, everybody, have, come here. Yeah, what? Who is this? I don't know what that is. Everybody have a great weekend. Yeah, thanks, thanks, most. Really appreciate yeah, it. Bye. Um, so, hey, y'all, stay on real quick. I got a couple of things to touch on uh, before you go. Um, let me just bring back up my uh, my little uh, thing here. So, a couple of announcements. So, uh, our next month's meeting will also be virtual um, for October. We just plan on Zooms until the pandemic starts to ease up a little bit. Um, plan on Friday, October 22nd for our next one. Uh, I've got something cool that I'm working on. I think that'll be a really good one as well. So watch for that to show up here in the schedule. We said this last time, we'll say it again. The Plano Dems board needs a secretary. So if you're interested, if you'd like to help out for you know a few hours a month, um, please let us know. Reach out to myself or Caroline or any of our other board members. Uh, and just and also just if you're interested in hanging out with us without being an official board member, let us know because we're Absolutely. always looking for yeah. you for more ideas and enthusiastic people at whatever time commitment because I know all y'all are super busy people. That's right. And then the last thing. So um, join Plano Dems. You know, this is a club. Uh, we, we love to have uh, members. Um, our, our annual dues is 25 bucks, but we're still running our $40 special. You join for 40 bucks. You'll be a member for a year and we'll send you a Plano Area Democrats shirt. Um, I know I actually owe a few to some folks and we just put a new order in this week. So we'll get some here shortly. Um, and as an additional bonus, if you join this month through the end of the year, you'll be good through 2022. So, I mean, gosh, you can't, you really can't beat that. Um, I think I saw Caroline put our uh, join us uh, URL in the chat. So please join us and be part of our, our, uh, our club um, as a benefit of, 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 of being a member, actually, you know, obviously you can come on to our Zooms and, and, and meetings and such. Uh, you don't have to be a member for that. That's fine. But we're going to have um, a primary election um, next, next year in the spring. Uh, we will probably be endorsing candidates. If you want to vote and uh, to endorse candidates, you got to be a member. So, so join up. And if you join now, like I said, you'll be good through the end of next year. And all right. All the money we raise now is going to go towards kicking Greg Abbott and Ken Paxton out of office. So it's all for yes. a very good cause. Yes, it is. So thanks everyone for coming on. I hope you found this was it, that this interesting. I actually had a lot of fun. I am a fanboy for, for Mose and his work. 
um, go check out his, his podcast and uh, watch again. We'll, we'll get our, our next uh, meeting next month, October 22nd. Uh, we'll have details up shortly. So y'all have a good, uh, good rest of your Friday. Have a good night. Uh, candidates, thank you for coming. I, I, I love you all. And, and I love all my members. Take care. Thanks a lot.